Hello, uh, welcome to the March Verse Virtual Reading uh, featuring Susanna Case, Carolyn Wright, and Dick Westheimer, and um, a revolving cast at the open <laughs> mic um, since many people who sign up don't show, so um, for one reason or the other. So I welcome you, and I guess we can get going this morning. Our first feature is Susanna Case. She's the author of eight books of poetry, most recently The Damage Done by Broadstone Books in 2022, Dead Shark on the End Train by Broadstone Books 2020, which won a Pinnacle Book Award for the best poetry book. Um, and okay, now that we're uh, introducing, could you please mute yourself if you haven't already. Um, it was also a New York City Book Award Distinguished Favorite and was a finalist for the Eric Koffer Book Award. She co-edited with Margot Taft Stever the anthology I Want to Be Loved by You, Poems on Marilyn Monroe, uh, published by Milk and Cake Press in 2022. And she caseworked for several decades as a university professor and program coordinator in New York City and is currently an ed editor of Slapering Hole Press. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Slapering Hole Press. <laughs> Hall. Slapping. Slapping Hall. Slapering Hole. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's an interesting name for a press. It, it's the old Dutch for Sleepy Hollow, which is where the press is located. That's I'm glad it's not what it sounds like. <laughs> it's been called all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you go ahead and read for us? Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Robbie. And thank you all for being here. I was at a reading the other day where a poet also had a, very, a, a book with a very na uh, narrative arc. And that poet said that the way that he approached readings was to just start with the first poem in the series and keep reading until his time ran out. And I'd, I'd never tried it that way. I always tried to kind of pick which poems I'm going to read, but I thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna try that. So that's what I'm doing today. I'm starting at the beginning and just going until my time runs out. So this is uh, The Damage Done. This is what it looks like. Um, is a story about a dead model who is the victim of FBI malfeasance during the late 60s, early 70s, during the COINTELPRO period, a period which targeted progressive groups and people who contributed to and otherwise supported progressive groups in uh, basically in an attempt to destroy the groups and destroy their lives. So at the beginning of the book, uh, the, the protagonist, Janie, is, is dead, and her story is told in a series of flashbacks. But at the beginning of the story, she's just getting discovered, and um, there's an initial poem that introduces. So this is woman speaking distinctly. If you're flame licked, chain nicked, does it mean you like? playing with fire, all kinds of things spin out of control, pyres end in dead torsos. If you think it's enough to be the country's sweetheart, you might be surprised when you're suddenly not. In that turnaround, you could make book on being watched and make your plan, the only way to avoid the stake on which you die, the way to rise above the blaze. Woman recumbent in car. This is where we first encountered Janie. A car sits in violation of parking rules, the only car on the street. In it, blonde hair peeks out from a blanket on the seat. It's early in the morning, a tow truck operator new on the job. He's back from vacation, wonders if he should have remained on the beach, the blanket reminding him of scratchy sand, pina coladas, his newly minted wife. 
Every day, people come back from vacation to tragedies. Picture him sitting in his truck, waiting for the police as he plays cuts from blonde on blonde. Every day, people listen to these songs. He's a Dylan, classic rock, a passionato, wonders if the dead woman is a debutante like Edie Sedgwick in Just Like a Woman. He wonders if his new wife is full of feminine tricks. There's a number of epistolary poems in this collection, and this is one of them. These are places in which I tend to insert my own voice into the narrative. Well, it's all my own voice, but more explicitly my own voice. And this is Dear Gia. Dear Type 34, lipstick red, Carmen Ghia, dear razor edge Ghia, expensive Ghia, styled in Italy, anointed by the gods. You are the car I would drive if I weren't the Volkswagen van type. Ghia, seemingly more BMW than VW, finished by 1969. Unlike the war, the surveillance, the 60s, so fast and sexy, the wood grain dash, so lusciously not a clunky American machine, my car that's not my car, that will probably never be my car, I will always love you. Dear Coop, that is not mine. I want to cry at this deprivation, life so unfair. Dare I steal you? Of course I don't dare, knowing you for a container of death, holding a woman who looks like she's sleeping. Yet there's so much lust for you, so much larceny in my heart. The detective can't sleep. If he smokes too much, maybe he won't think too much. So here are the Marlboros, and here are his teeth, a yellowing broken up roadway of too many cigarettes. He's thinking about a pigeon grazing nearby, a cooing ruin, how every trash pigeon in New York City is descended from a banded homing pigeon that didn't go straight home. Nights he tosses, sweats, it's the D-ball, steroid for weightlifting. It's the rust-colored stain on his bedroom ceiling that looks like a fish, one with no insides like the drawing a child makes. But his son is bored of drawing, his woman not looking at him fondly. It's the dead that keep him awake and a crowd hovering like today at a double feature of the gorgeous grotesque, noticing something not right. This is another epistolary one, dear Carol. On TV, when I see a, <clears throat> a marcher decked in helmet, body armor carrying a gun, demonstrating in support of the worst president ever, a cop shaking his hand as if greeting a member of the club. I think of you in skinny capris, your light brown hair teased into a crown, so queen-like and so damn young. Do you ever think about the doo-wop we listened to that summer in the Catskills on my tinny transistor? Back in the city after vacation, it took three subway trains to visit you in Brownsville, the graffiti-covered halls of the walk-up where you lived. I was a free-range teen, savvy about the subway, less so about social class, and I was the one who always made the trip to Brooklyn. Remember when you announced your engagement? He was a cop your voice rising at the end in excitement as you offered your hand to show off your ring. We were barely adults. By then, it seemed the police were rioting everywhere. Oh, I said, forgetting my manners, silence, and the chasm already there opened up that last time we spoke. Bystanders. The other cop is guessing suicide. He wants to go home. Pills on the floor of the car in empty containers, Valium, Benzedrine, seltzer water. They'll know after the weekend. Nondescript yellow brick apartment buildings, maybe a resident who says, yes, I saw something, or a porter door opened with a wooden bar overnight, sorry, door fastened with a wooden bar overnight. Remember Kitty Genovese murdered in Queens? Nobody admits seeing anything from apartment windows, hundreds of windows, some curtains, some not. 
The dog walkers hunker down, sullen. No, <clears throat> nobody wants to be accused of ignoring a dying woman, not calling the police, letting her be killed right there in the open, if that's what happened next to the pretty park where the first robin of the season picks its way through ground cover. Woman identified. A Tootsie Roll with arms, the detective calls Janie now that they've ID'd her. She's skinny with a single name like Twiggy, a vogue spread in being dead, warrant consideration by the tabloids, a close-up of her face that's not a death mask, a point of view that tisk tisks, here's a sorry chick who couldn't hack the good life. She's pretty, angles like knife blades, torso straight like a boy's. In the largest image, Janie looks untroubled and is running in a bold pattern dress past a bridge, debris in soft focus piled off by the side. The detective laughs about it later with his buddies, a strange photo to sell clothes you can't even clearly see, surrounded by rubble, painted on eyelashes, as if she's a child's doll. She looks as if she could blow away. Part of her did. Thank you. Thank you so much. Those were very intriguing poems. What's the name of the book? That the it's, it's The Damage Done. I'm putting some information in the chat. Thank you so much. To yeah. Find it. Yeah, I admire the way it coheres, having wrangled recently with a manuscript. <laughs> Thanks very much. Our next reader is Carolyn Wright. Carolyn's new book is Masquerade, a memoir in poetry, published by Lost Horse Press in 2021. Her previous books include This Dream the World, New and Selected Poems, uh, also published by Lost Horse in 2017, whose title poem won the Pushcart Prize Oh, I can count you among the few I know who have actually won it and also appeared in the Best American Poetry 2009 and the anthology Raising Lily Ledbetter, Women Poets Occupy the Workspace, Lost Horse 2015. She received 10 Push Prize, card, uh, Push Prize uh, nominations. Carolyn has um, five earlier books of poetry, a volume of essays, and five award-winning volumes of translation from Spanish and Bengali. A contributing editor for the Pushcart Prizes, she teaches for Seattle's Richard Hugo House. She's lived in Chile, traveled in Brazil on a Fulbright, and she returns to Brazil, uh, returned to Brazil in 2018 on an Instituto Sacarar, Sacatar Artist Residency in Bahia. She's also received NEA and Four Culture Grants and a Fulbright Scholar Award um, that she got in early 2020. We'll take her back to Bahia after COVID pandemic subsides in Brazil, if it ever does. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's that's quite a problem. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm wrangling with that whole process right now. So wish me luck. Well, I'm going to read a few poems from the new book. It's called Masquerade, and it's got this incredibly, you know, colorful title, which I always say reminds me of Mardi Gras meets Fillmore West. So there it is. Uh, and uh, but I'm going to do a few of the poems that are sort of lyric narrative, because a lot of them have to do with music and references to jazz and the blues. And so, and also things like food and humor and some real turbulence, but uh, let's see where I go this time. I'm going to read a poem called Gumbo Nights. You know, gumbo is this wonderful New Orleans stew. Move away from that table. You tease as I help myself to a plate full of your Creole étouffée. You gonna end up wide as you are tall. All those evenings you chuckle at your own jokes as the gumbo shimmers with scallops and okra, shallots and filet. 
while I stir batter for the cornbread and splash a shot glass of burgundy into the squash chowder's slow ochre bubbles. Trouble's brewing, you smile, smoothing your hands over the bottle of budget Chardonnay as if it were a woman. Inside that thin woman, there's a fat woman fighting to get out. Out pops the cork with a satisfying thwock, to which I laugh my answer, popping my own cheek with a finger as you light the gallow jug candle with its fringed skirt of wax drippings, centerpiece of my thrift shop tablecloth. The kitchen walls lean in to listen, and I listen as Sarah Vaughn croons lover man on my small radio. Almost a lullaby that winter when jazz is as new to me as Cape Cod's lilac dawns. Dawn is a voice still trembling in my throat, but Nina Simone's bent blue violet notes soothe my body into believing in itself. Do I believe what you call the body's shy audacity? as we sip from after dinner jelly glasses, last of the Chardonnay, smoky and pale, while you gaze at me, appraise me, and I gaze back, matching the gleam in my eye to yours. Your knock on my door on New Year's, weeks before, as I unpacked the gift wrapped packets from a visit home, the same day, one of your old lovers headed home after a week-long rendezvous. Through my wall, two sets of footsteps hollow on floorboards of your studio, echo receding down the wood plank steps, thud falls on winter's frost-heavy path to the bus stop. Stop it, I almost told myself, but didn't because Billy Holiday growled, how could you, to some double dealing lover from her tiny big band stand inside my radio. The radio's lingering swing as I heard your steps retrace themselves, erase themselves from the walkway and wood plank stairs, canceling out all short term memories. Forget that foolish week, you murmured, your face as I let you into my studio, haggard with bravado. Did we know the midnight hour had already told for us from the church steeple's pale melon clock face? Let's face the music and dance, cried the music in my head, ahead of yours for a change. A change gon' come, I know, cried Sam Cook. A change the woman whose fury sent him out beyond the sky never could have known. What did we know then as you stood up and came around my table to take me again as your lover? Lover man, oh, where can you be? Sobbed the jazz women on the radio as the woman I was then cave in and let you come, though I was already moving away from the table. Well, that, that encapsulates some of the story. If you haven't uh, known it yet, this is a, a memoir in poetry about um, a relation, interracial relationship. He's African-American and she is white. Uh, now we're gonna to go to New Orleans where a good deal of the action takes place. Uh, and this poem is called The Divide, New Orleans. And uh, I think you'll recognize some of those gift shops uh, in the French Quarter. I step into the old South gifty shoppy out of Charter Street's midday swelter. The doorbell's falsetto tinkle. 
the glacial wall of AC pouring over me like a broken levee's flood water. Hey, honey, the lady behind the counter chirps. How's every little thing? She nods, her bouffant hairdo blue rinses the air. Miss Lucille Ann Boudreaux, proprietress. The plaque on the wall speaks in Garamond. Can I help you? I lean against white wicker, gaze at the trays of pralines and guava jam, chicory coffee and grease-stained bags of beignets. The Mississippi's yellow silt rises in my throat. Two months since my body has let down its blood cycle. Just looking, thank you. Strands of comus crew beads looped over crinoline, antebellum hoop skirts on armatures. Step and fetch it postcards. An entire shelf of mammy dolls. What in God's name do I want here? Sit right down, honey. Heat's got you tuckered out. Miss Lucille chatters on, her customers floating through the pastel air like crepe paper flowers. Then you step in. The bells jangle, burgles the air. Your figure obsidian against the mullioned window. You smile, pull out the books you've brought. Solemn Song of Solomon and the Bluest Eye. All the doors in Miss Lucille's face slam. Get up out that chair, Miss, lest you mean to buy it. Gratuitous regrets. You halt by the masquerade ball mannequins, your face frozen into a Benin mask. Heartwood's mahogany cheekbones scored with the slashes for resistance, fear. The only face that Miss Lucille Ann would ever see. What is my face saying then? Not this, not you. Blood debts coming due. We have to become our own doors. I put your books in my straw bag and stand up. I want to tell her, Miss Lucille, sometimes our shared skin is the surface of the moon. Sometimes just another alphabet in which to spell goodbye. I take your hand and we step into the blistered street. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to go on too long, but I am going to read one more poem, uh, and, and you'll know the length of it because it is a sestina. Among all the other things that I have committed in my life, I have committed a few sestinas in my day, and this is one of them. It, it sort of portrays a, a phone call that took place uh, afterward, um, you know, some years later. It's called Sestina, That Mouth. That mouth always going, you taunt, as I gab on the phone with poets from Napoleon's bar. Your nervous lover blowing plosives and palatals into the rum-colored mouthpiece. My face flushed as the season's zephyr cheeks, puffing from the celestial edges of old maps, trying to scare up a storm. Our shotgun house lists on its storm pilings. Girl, you carrying on that phone like there's no tomorrow. That Beulah Baptist edge to your voice. The plea I miss blames lover fixing the house from the inside. Season of sweat and fragile equity, you strip old color from the sheetrock. Our balance sheet is colored red, like tempest clouds that agitate a firestorm survivor. Unsecured debt and the hurricane season come around again. 
get off that phone and talk to me, you mean. Who else is your lover? Your unvoiced question with its double edge. We're tired of living on the edge, taking our losses up front. Would the sky's color change its mind? Could we go on as lovers, as our self-protective gestures, those private storms? Think into the vortex of the telephone's receiver, reverse polarities of the season. We already lean into another season. You embrace your own shadow at the room's far edge. Take me as I am, I say, and hang up the phone. Weapons in your concealed history scare me. Color of your skin, a risk we share. Desire like a summer storm, I almost could have married if I were a lover who could smile past your other lovers. Could I smile now, years too late to give our season another chance? My leaving you, a freak storm that gathered its own momentum. Reasons I acknowledge, debts to each other deferred. Memories, colors don't fade from your voice on today's blue telephone. The season bleeds into another decade's color. Millennial storms are on the rise. You're on edge now on this phone with me. But who else is your lover? Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, that was wonderful. Um, I'm pleased to be introduced to your work. Thank you so much. Our last feature today is Dick Westheimer, and he has, with his wife and writing companion, Debbie, lived on a plot of land in rural Southwest Ohio for over 40 years. He's a Rattle Poetry Prize finalist. In addition to Rattle, his most recent poems have appeared in Pine Mountain Sand and Gravel, Patterson Review, Chautauqua Review, Rise Up Review, Ekphrastic Review, and Cutthroat and anthologized in I Thought I Heard a Cardinal Sing, among others. Much of his work can be found at the rest, which apparently didn't make it onto my page. I'm so sorry. So go ahead and read because I don't know what happened to the second page of this. Oh, okay. All it, all it said was dickwestheimer.com. Uh -huh. Well. Uh, I'm glad I, I didn't rarely up rarely updated but uh occasionally oh what a treat to follow these magnificent poems um i just need to take a breath uh catch my breath and and uh and anyway I'm, I'm really delighted to have followed them <clears throat> um as some of you know i write a lot of um uh, poems of immediacy um, and poems responding to uh, news events or what many of us are experiencing. Uh, and I'll start with one of those. And I also like to read it at open at readings, my more recent work. So this one is actually one from yesterday. And it's responding to a, um, a sign uh, that many you might have seen a woman arrested in Russia protesting holding a blank sign. Because what's more powerful than blankness? So the the poem, the title of the poem is blank, not the word blank, just a blank. And the epigraph is from poet Manuel Iris. Every poem is a translation of silence. I step to the open mic and recite the empty space between the words. The crowd quiets and quiets and quiets as I quietly hum nothing. A violinist chins her instrument, wafts her hand bowless over the strings which sing silent to growing things, to grasses and grain and smoke, all a cacophony of hope. 
the novelist opens her leafless book and reads the fourth word down on the sixth absent page, breathes in and in and in until she sinks to her knees, replete. The audience rises to its feet, all applaud one-handed, remove their shoes and pad hushed to the library where each recites every word from every book missing from every empty shelf. Overhead, a lightning bolt produces no thunder, a derecho wind does not howl. Here, the woman who holds the blank sign translates the silence into the flux between every heartbeat, the space between every smudge of every ink, every last breath of the dead, every empty prison cell, each poem not written, every spin of every atom of um i don't know about you all but this has been well but the title of the poem is bodies responding to contingent times and i'd be curious whether you're responding the same way i am bodies responding to contingent times my jaw still aches. It's a victim of war. My tooth and root throb from incessant grinding, which will pass, I am told. Although over there, the bodies pile up. The score will be kept. The dead will fill the ledgers of woe. The dentist tells me my teeth are fine. X-rays reveal no rot or ruined crowns. She suggests I meditate or wear a mouth guard to seek relief. I think to tell her about the dreams that wake me, the tangled sheets, my visions of hellscapes here after a great undoing. But I refrain when I see her calming green eyes fall to her own trembling hands. Um, on a different note, um, a dear young friend of ours has had a couple of um, uh, miscarriages and stillbirth, and this poem is dedicated to her. It's called The Bearing of a Butterfly, after Rorschach card number three. Spot of blood at 20 weeks a stain, a gathering pain, a quickening kick, then none. A labor of love bleeding free of me. They call it a miscarriage, but I now see it was the bearing of a butterfly, its trembling wings brushing blush rose petal dust in the darkness. Um, I'm just going to follow that with another poem from this week, a little love poem, Portrait at 68. My body and bone hang tight onto my caged heart, the one that failed me 10 years ago, the one that now shoots mild pain my way reminds me, I move closer to becoming the dust I was made from. I am 40 pounds less flesh than then, weight lost to knowing death so well. Every day I run the roads nearby and feel my wedding band bounce slack on the finger it used to pudge against. I smile knowing the loose fit is a measure of fidelity, connotes how close my lover and I now fit, how I pass my palm, over her back, feel it warm and not much broader than my splayed hand. Say aloud what I've said for 40 years. I love this back. And know her whole body strikes a fire, a gift of these long years that yields as much light as heat. Um, I don't know how many of you have become either reacquainted and addicted to Twitter or never were or 
have not succumbed, but I have. And one of the things that I've noticed as the weeks have gone on since the beginning of the invasion of uh, Ukraine is fewer and fewer and fewer posts as the death toll piles up and the suffering increases exponentially. We have short attention spans. Uh, and this one was in response to a photograph that the uh, woman Lindsay Adario took of the family that had been hit by mortar fire lying in the streets. It's just heartbreaking. And I saw an interview with you, and this is called Half-Life of Portraits of War. The witness displayed her portrait of woe. I bit my lip. My face wrenched tight. My rage unmasked. I kicked the cat. The cat, another victim of war, does not know about the towhead child in the pink puffy coat, about her big brother in blue, his little backpack askew. The cat cowers as I walk by. But soon he forgets and nuzzles his blunt nose on my leg. How soon will I forget the towhead child, her bloodied mother, the brother and friend, his roller suitcase? the dead. The witness will not forget. The soldier who tried to forget will not protect will not forget. The shooter will not forget. Only the cat and Putin and I will forget. Um, so this is another responsive poem and thinking about are not inappropriate, incredible empathy we have with the suffering of people who are streaming out of and suffering in Ukraine. But one thing that has been very clear is that empathy seems to be much more um, easy to come by because these people look like us. And this is called A Sword in Both Hands. And the epigraph is from Dion Brand. One is misled when one looks at the sails and majesty of tall ships instead of their cargo. We are a camera photographing itself, America. We are the majesty of tall ships and we are the cargo, America. We are the jeweled sword and we are the slain. We raise the blade and knight the brave in Ukraine, America. We bless, bless them with crowns and say they look like America, America. We arm them with garlands of dragon slaying missiles and javelins of the finest steel. We bear our sword arm, America, and intone our money prayers. We strip the evil enemy of coin and commerce. We are money gods, America. And this we do with the right hand. With the left, we hold a pockmarked sword notched with brown bodies, America. We place the sword in the hands of bone saw kings who do not look like America, America, to slay those who the camera cannot see. Because we say, America, that brown and far away are not America, America. Those who have before them other gods than America are not America, America. Their brave cannot be knighted by our jeweled blades because only those we say are America are America, America. The camera that can only photograph itself, America, is a mirror that only sees itself, is a sword that only slays itself, America. Um, and Robbie, do I have time for a short last one or not? Nope. I'm okay. sorry. No, no worries. That's, that's where I thought I would be ending. Yeah, that's, that's a very good ending anyway. A terrific set. Thank you so much for your reading. Wonderful feature. Thank you. And now, uh, we will start with our open mic. Our first person who was signed up, I don't believe Blanche Cabindale, Dr. Blanche Cabindale is here. He was on the list. Not so here. not here. So 
Our first reader um, who was on the list is Gary Grossman. Thanks. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks for hosting this, Ravi, and thanks for all the attendees. Uh, so uh, I have two poems to read, which my understanding is the limit. Uh, this is called Going Out to a Movie During COVID. Year two of the plague, a February evening with coats and scarves to fend off the violet cold pack of dusk. I sport a blue Oxford cloth shirt and khakis, and you a slinky emerald wool dress and heels. For a year, our outer skins have been pajama bottoms and tees, and it feels as if we have morphed into the snow moon, illuminating the corners of a colorless night. Perhaps clothes don't make the man or woman, but I feel as if normality was slowly repainting my torso. I reach for the cool brass knob of the front door, but quickly turn, draw you close and say, let's kiss before we leave. A look of surprise, then your lips part slightly and our tongues braid a necklace of linked lives. You take a tissue from your purse and reach up wiping a streak of scarlet from the corner of my mouth, then say, I'll have to redo my lipstick. Thank you. Uh, and this is another COVID poem. It's entitled Mothers and Daughters Walking. It is June 2020, and my wife is talking me down yet again from the paranoid heights of imaginary COVID health professional that she is. We quarantine in place, the days mostly crushed like the cans in our recycling bin. I slide off my harness of fear by jogging, though my left knee protests like an unoiled screen door. So my gait is odd, a mildly hamstrung horse for five miles of therapy. Who said every cloud has a silver lining? Surely some are copper, tin or even lead? Does Odin hurl COVID boats, bolts to keep us on our toes or do plagues come from Asgard's random number generator? On my jogs during quarantine, I see mothers and daughters walking. Peas from the same pod, high school, middle school, even fourth graders home for Zoom instruction with mom and dad. Everyone is tired of our ruffled feathers from months in the human chicken poop. And we all ache for the smell of sunlight and the taste of a fresh breeze. COVID sent us outside, stretched our legs at midday, let us relearn how to listen, even released kindness. So perhaps there is a silver lining. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Our next person up at the open mic is Penelope Moffat. And um, Gary reminded me that I forgot to say that people at the open mic can read two poems for five minutes, whichever comes first. Okay, thank you. Um, I have to say I've really enjoyed the readings this morning. It's really been a wonderful morning for poetry. Um, I'm going to read, of course, two poems, and um, one is in the March 1st virtual. It's called Honey. Bees swarm my thoughts. Call me as they called the ladybug who rode up to the office where I work. Was she inside the envelope nestled with blind Huber, Nick Flynn's poems about bees? Or did she climb on in the postal truck? I ripped the plastic open, spilled the book, and she appeared, then flitted back to Huber. With a blue glass mug, I trapped her on a card, rode six floors down, found a geranium plant across the street, nudged her with a copper-colored key. Was it because the metal looked like honey that she clung to it? I talked her out 
onto the green leaves. A white-haired woman in a purple face mask, scolding and cajoling an insect, seeking release. And I was going to read the other poem in the March 1st virtual, but um, Dick Westheimer mentioning this wonderful anthology that's just come out of Appalachian Poets, and my copy just arrived. So I'm gonna read, I have two poems in there. Um, I barely qualified for it, having spent a few childhood years in Ohio. <laughs> you have to have a strong connection to Ohio. It actually is pretty strong, but, um, so this poem is called Walking Away. And actually, Robbie, I wrote this, the first draft of this in your generative workshop last year. So it feels good to read it here where you can hear it. Walking away. We were walking away from a concert hall where we'd just listened to Bach or Brahms or Beethoven, our small family moving through the Ohio night when my mother lit up from the music lilted out some echo of the violins and threw her arm around me. Immediately, I slipped away, left her embracing air until my elder sister stepped in, hugged her back. I was 12, embarrassed and repulsed. How could I know the, shrug the shrugging off would stay so many years, rise up when I think of her who loved me, loved us? and is gone. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Penelope. Our next reader is Mary McCarthy. I have to unmute. Um, thank you, Robbie. And this has really been great so far today. Um, I have two poems that are, are both uh, in some ways about stars, uh, but from different angles. Uh, this first one was an ekphrastic uh, to Van Gogh's famous Starry Night painting. And everybody I'm sure is aware of, of that painting. Someone in the uh, VV community asked me to read it. The Break. We used to watch the stars together, leaning shoulder to shoulder in the balmy air, eyes lifted to trace the constellations. Until one night I saw the stars come loose, the world's end promised, beautiful and terrible. I saw what you didn't, couldn't see. For you, the stars were still fixed in their familiar patterns, always as it had been, always well. But mesmerized, I saw them spinning out of their orbits, surging across the sky in pinwheels of white fire, waves of light coming down on us like a galaxy tsunami I could not unsee. Trying to convince you useless, you saw no, felt no threat. For you, the stars still marched in ordered ranks across the midnight sky, the world's roof solid and still safe. You said I was dreaming, mad, mistaken, wrong. But I knew they were coming, falling like hot sparks through the blistered air, knew they would burn all they touched, white phosphorus cinders on our skin, flames that could incinerate the world, worse than a bomb, more final than a forest fire, exploding over us where we could find no shelter, no bridge or tunnel close enough, no rescue, no escape, no way to stop it, Nowhere to hide. That night, the end of us, sudden and hard, our stars divided, split, never the same. I didn't realize, well, I didn't write it. I wrote it before the invasion, but it has that echo in it. Okay, this is the other one. Mother, You've been gone 11 years, and still I wish I could see you, hear you, have you here with me at the edge of an ocean you never saw. Your life played out in a narrow stage, a neighborhood, a city, a state you never left. 
I think you would have loved travel, something new every day, something outside the rhythm of your labor, the sameness of days all in a row, the small drudgeries of keeping seven children in a crowded space, of the washing, the ironing, the scrub and polish, the meal after meal after meal, filling and cutting up your days, leaving you one brief corner after all were in bed to spend in quiet with a glass of beer and a book, reading and winding your hair and bobby pins, or allowing you a few hours to sit in the dark on the porch and count the stars. I know you would love the ocean, its power, its rhythmic waves always coming in, its secret life, stranger than our own, moving deep without air and deeper into the dark, down to the bedrock of continents where inventive life, even in the cold, or the heat from a break in the crust, oozing magma, finds a way in forms wilder than our dreams. I think you would understand the ocean, mother of generation, with her own secrets, her own ways, her memories, older than our first blind progenitors. I can see you here with me like we used to be at night on that small back porch with our meager slice of sky. I can see you lean back and catch your breath as you tilt your head back and drink up all the stars, their radiance enough to slake a lifelong thirst, enough to fill you to the brim with wonder, finding yourself held at last in the arms of the first mother. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Our next reader is Greg Bell. Okay, I just went on unmute. Um, uh, this has been a wonderful reading. Um, really delightful. Of course, these are <clears throat> heavy times. And uh, this too is a, a poem that emerged and forced its way onto the page yesterday. I'll, I'll see if I can get through it. It's called Mariupol. Like the shell of a monolithic insect, it stands looking out with a hundred eyes hollowed. Before it became this new paleolithic ruin, before the lies and ordinance, before the hammer of empire. What was it? Who lived there? Where are they? What rare beast plucked out all its eyes, incinerated them, left the skull to haunt me in this sleep as new inhabitants scuttle in for heat? Um, on a lighter note, <laughs> um, it is the day before the official first uh, day of spring. Starts tomorrow. <laughs> so take heart, folks uh, who are in the midst of uh, winter storms. The, the clock will come round. Persephone. Always part of the story, there is the understory of a girl dug in like a fish head in the loam, coaxing the roots to wind her downward into the bottomless cavern of abyss, abducted there for the wide world's ransom, and then ransomed again for all the world, urging upward the trunks of trees to carry her up to see the panoramic view, to see herself in the near and far of field and forest. Always part of the forest is the story of before the forest, before even the story of origin, how still she comes through root of being, through time's blast, through winter's reckoning, that girl, that spring, first she, her pomegranate breath, her porphyry eyes, her pale wet skin, waiting, waiting to repeat the first beginning, multitudinous fingered reach of life into every sharp and velvet thing. Thank you, that was lovely. 
Well, thank you. Our following readers are um, added to fill in the spaces left by people who signed up and didn't show. So the first person who did that is Julian Matthews. Hi. Hi. Just the one poem. How many ways can I prove to you I'm not a robot? So the internet wants me to prove that I'm not a robot again. It gives me a set of square options and asks me to please click on image that contains a bicycle. So I spot a bicycle, click. Another bicycle, click. Wait, there's only one wheel in here. Is that a unicycle? But it says specifically bicycle, not unicycle, not tricycle, not monocycle. I'm a detail-oriented man. I'm very specific about getting clear, specific, unambiguous instructions which demand clear, specific, unambiguous replies. But the image only has one wheel. And wait, the earlier one I clicked on had two bicycles. Bicycles, plural. The question says click on bicycle, singular. Are these trick questions? I'm wary of trick questions, so I click verify and the page refreshes. I fail the test. But phew, it gives me a second chance. Now it says click on image that has a traffic light in it. I'm not a robot. I know a traffic light when I see one. But wait, first bicycles, now traffic lights. Was this test designed by someone from the DMV? I haven't been so stressed since my driving test years ago. And wait. Back then, I was more stressed about the practical part, parallel parking, hmm, traffic light, click, traffic light, click, wait. Is the traffic light pole considered part of the overhead traffic light? I suppose so. Click, 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 wait. Is the shadow of the overhead traffic light, traffic light on the road considered traffic light? Well, there would be no shadow if there was no traffic light. Is this an existential test? Damn it, this is so vague. I'm a detail-oriented man. I'm very specific about getting clear, unambiguous instructions which demand clear, specific, unambiguous answers. I click verify and get kicked out. Damn it. I just realized I was kicked out by a robot deciding whether I am a robot or not. How ironic. How judgy. How utterly ridiculous. The fact that I flunked out your test, you silly reject robot, is proof enough that I am human. After all, hey robot, if you gave me a pictures of nine potential presidents and asked me to click on which candidate can actually do the job, I would click skip and move on. I also know what a bicycle is, you silly robot. I'm not, I not only know how to identify a bicycle, I know how to ride one as well. Can you? And I can identify a traffic light when I see one. I know red means stop, green means go, and yellow means go faster. That's my choice. That's my prerogative. That's being human, silly robot. Being human is about taking risks. Being human is about making decisions, good or bad. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we run a red light and cause accidents. Sometimes we hurt ourselves. Sometimes we hurt others. Sometimes we fall off our bicycles and scrape our knee and it bleeds and it hurts. Sometimes we ride our bicycles home in the rain. Some days we ride so hard we can't tell whether it's raindrops or teardrops on our cheeks. That's being human, silly robot, but you'll never know. You can't even give clear, specific, unambiguous instructions that demand clear, specific, unambiguous answers. I refresh the page and it says, you have reached your verification limit for today. Please try again in 24 hours. I get off the internet and gripe to my wife about the robot. She says she's just discovered her driving license is expired and she can't renew it online. I must drive her to the office next week to renew it. I'm a detail-oriented man, very specific about getting clear, specific, unambiguous instructions. I nod approvingly. I'm not a robot after all. At least someone appreciates this human. I touch my face to wipe away the tear that isn't there. Thank you. Thank you. That was a terrific uh, idea for a, a poem. Thank you very much. Our next uh, person on the list is Sterling Warner. 
Okay, this is from uh, my most recent book. You can't really see it. It's from Fly Traps. Um, and uh, the first poem is called Downtime. This was uh, published in uh, Virtual Verse. Patricia sits reading a chapbook, legs crossed, eyes locked under words that roll off each page and begin to speak the language of pastel clouds, blue and pink. Half moon rising above the cotton sky, a panoramic dreamscape envisioned and eternalized by a redhead bibliophile. Focused, unperturbed by other people intruding on her personal universe, peach colored walls meet in uneven corners, promise longevity, frame Patricia's minimalist library embellished by a circular glass table and long cedar benches a literary sanctuary fortified by surrealism. Hours pass, incandescent lights flicker, cast shadows on text, give voice, odd texture and dimension to passionate verse as Patricia's uh, syncopated imagination visualizes dramatic human certainties, listens uh, to timeless lovers exchange vows and fills empty spaces with private metaphors. Thank you. And my second poem, uh, I decided to read because I don't think I've ever read it anywhere before. It's called Saddle Shoes. Oxfords. Everybody wore or wanted them when I grew into grammar school. My senior sister scored the first pair, bone white, with a light brown saddle. In our penny pinchin household, she wore them a year and a half before each foot grew in length and girth. I started kindergarten and abruptly required something substantial, a hard leather sole to replace supple doe skin beaded moccasins. Whatever possessed my mother to fertilize the reluctant, uh, feminize the reluctant feet by coercing me to wear my sister's time-worn shoes, knowing too well that trendy male Oxford sported a milk chocolate colored exterior with a dark brown saddle. Mom smothered the bone white toe box vamp and heel with liquid burnt sienna shoe polish that stubbornly resisted solid pigmentation and left random brown streaks atop mustard colored wingtips. Scuffing the leather with rocks and dirt, walking through gutters, keeping only anchors, ankles visible, scraping sides against aggregate walkways, intentionally splashing through mud puddles, praying for a pedestrian oil slick to submerge them, masking the putrid hue of hopelessly disguised shoes. I wore my sister's poorly dyed Oxfords like army boots, fortified to weather vicious assaults. Visual muggings, mean-spirited whisperers, bathroom stall snickers, resulted resulted in an onslaught of pernicious peers, always insulting my footwear. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> that was terrific. Okay, um, our next reader is um, Michael LaBombarna. Hello. Uh my first poem is called Diamond. A diamond is my muse. I used to think it was him in, in the form of one woman. And I thought all my poems were selfish for the love of his mother and father, which despite good intentions had not conveyed. Half God, guardian angel, you're the voice I use to address myself and to answer that voice. O oh, spirit that enacts me, directing life, promising me that if I have faith in you, will grant me the power of a mustard seed, 
be my heart, mind, and host. Not man nor woman, spirit. I need to visit you with or higher. I am a seed in the eyes of woman. Half spirit, half force, half me. He provides the same coin. Michael, we can't hear you very well. You keep going in and out. All right. What I do about that? Can you hear me now? It isn't that we can't hear you. It's that your audio is cutting out like you don't have enough bandwidth or you're not close enough to the microphone. Try, try just stopping the video and just going. Uh, sometimes that, that gives you more width. All right, sax, guitar, and campfire. Will you to me a pin in a long sax that winds around my like a boa, squeezing me till I hear celestial choirs this evening? It's important that I hear the trumpets and symbol of angels in the starlit night among these insect infested choirs drawn by a crepitating fire. Condition with me. I'm wooden. Fire will charge these bones to ash. Pick up the pace, draw the sword, and take it into my flesh. Pin high up in the darkness, coming the moans with your rising nose. Please listen, Harris. So sharp rap pulses your breath, initial lassitude, turning to the body to melt the skin. Sinews with a slack string on a guitar. Change your instrument. Prove to me, but to yourself, that there's more than one mode of transport, the cloud filled ether. Be one with the work of your fingers. Friction and finger on fret summons my frequencies and desires into one song sung in this evening outdoor chapel, in embrace of trees. This musical vesper, desire is sated, hope fulfilled, and loneliness is only a word found in the dictionary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Our last reader today is Mary Ann Sislin. Thank you, Robbie, for squeezing me in. And thank you, everybody, for such a wonderful reading. I'm, I'm glad to have come back. Um, and here's the poem that I'm reading. Um, we, why we never tried to find the elms, the elms being the college where my mother graduated from. Why we never tried to find the elms. Empty tobacco barns stood in fields beside the highway in mild light that seemed dim after summer out west. In the car, my mother was telling stories about her college, Our Lady of the Elms, just a few miles north and west of here. I knew her stories well. Still, all these years, we had never tried to find the elms. She had said it was tucked into a neighborhood with watered lawns and oak trees, with spruce houses, stained glass. It must have been so gracious to a girl who grew up behind Peter's garage and walked beneath the tracks each day, uphill to St. Bernard's. I knew I had walked with Graham to church through the tunnel stench. In college, mom said, she was happy to sleep on a cot in a room full of girls, to take classes on Saturday, to pretend to eat lukewarm mackerel every Friday while the Dean of Discipline swept through the clammy dining hall. By 1987, the rows of cots were long gone. The few nuns left wore pantsuits. With students, they laughed over lunch. Every Friday, the cafeteria would serve slices of greasy Hamburg pizza that mom would have pretended to eat 
had we stopped by her old school. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so that'll do it for this month. Next month, we have a special treat. Howard, would you like to say, uh, to talk about the re reading you're part of for next month? Well, you can, uh, you can just uh, uh, know that uh, I'll be looking forward to being with everyone and uh, giving a little impression of uh, what I write and why and how, and uh, looking forward to that next month. And his fellow features, thank you, Howard. His fellow features are Avia Kushner and um, Julia uh, Dasbach, who was born in the Ukraine. And she has many beautiful poems about uh, that subject that I'm sure she will read. So be here <laughs> next month. Uh, thank you for contributing to today's wonderful reading. I'm going to be hosting another reading on Tuesday. And um, of course, I did not bring a link, but um, I will send a link, and I probably already have, to Verse Virtual, and you can check it out there. And it's also on my Facebook page. So I'll see you next month. Thank you, Robbie. Thank, thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you for a wonderful feature. Um, Bye. Bravo to all. I, I have a question. Uh, uh, someone addressed something to me, and I cannot find it to to read the end of it. Um, is is this post someplace uh, complete with the chat so that I can go back through it? Yes. You can save save your chat, Greg. If there's a um, three dots um, next, on the chat window in the bottom right corner. Uh huh. If you click on that you'll see something that says save chat I and see then that. search for zoom on your computer and you'll find a folder that has that chat in it. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Dick. Greg, that was more than likely me. I was asking if you speak Spanish because I have a poem that I'm turning into a video. I need someone with a wonderful voice like yours to narrate it. Um, I'm not in Spanish, but I, I grew up uh, in the American Southwest. And is C. All right. I'll contact you. OK. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I hope that some of you find my announcement for Tuesday's reading. It's at a bizarre time at one o'clock in the afternoon because it's <laughs> it's for a senior community. Mm -hmm. But next month, I take it over and move it to a different time and day. And I'm looking for a name for that new uh, virtual reading series. So anybody how about, who has that. How about the after school so Mr. Petri can read? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little long, Mark. Oh, sorry. <laughs> And I thought it was egotistical for me to suggest that, but after all, nothing matters except me. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> what is the reading you're you're going to be hosting, Robbie? Um, it's Tuesday. It's the fourth Tuesday of, of every month. There has been, but this is the last one of that series before I move it to a different time of day. So it's one o'clock on this coming Tuesday. Uh, and there is an invitation on my Facebook page, and there should be also on Verse Virtual page. And can you, you are, can you share the link right now? Yeah, in, if in I you chat? give me a minute, okay? okay. You guys we're, can chat a minute. Yeah, I'll, we're we're in no hurry. <laughs> All it's right, a great I'll, reading. It's a great reading. I've gone there when I'm when I'm on days where I haven't taught, and it's a wonderful group of poets, and it's very. Uh, I want to say it's it's together. It's like the poets are interested in each other. And to be honest, some of the poems are sort of goofy, but sometimes it's nice to hear goofy real poems that people are reading because they enjoy writing them. Yeah, I'm it's... going to stop the recording and then we can go ahead and visit. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
I'm having yeah. trouble finding it. 